Эйяла Рабиновича из компании Моминис. Он а, сделает презентацию, расскажет нам о такой важной теме, как а, обнаружение приложений, здесь это называется. Да? А, сейчас известно приложений очень много на всех платформах, и зачастую успех игры определяется тем, а, найдут ее люди вообще или нет. Смогут они попробовать поиграть в нее или нет? Так вот, сейчас мы узнаем, как творчески подойти к решению этого вопроса и что делать для того, чтобы все-таки найти аудиторию для своего проекта. Пожалуйста. Okay. How do you explain when things don't go according to plan? Or even better, when others manage to achieve things that defy the fundamental assumptions. Why some games are downloaded by millions and millions of users, and other games developed by developers that are better funded and more experienced don't? Why some games make it to the top, and other games are buried in the landslide? Truth be told, many reasons can explain why some games succeed and other games fail. In the next 20 minutes, I'm going to touch many of these points, But let's start by having a higher level view of the mobile market. If there's one thing I can say for sure about the market is that it is booming. Quite frankly, I wish there was another way of saying that because I'm also tired of listening to the same phrasing over and over again. But it is the best way to describe what's going on. The size of the market is $2.7 billion dollars and it's going to triple itself in the next three years. And this kind of growth is unprecedented. But as big as the opportunity is, it is also a very vicious playground. There are more than 500,000 applications today. 99% of them completely disappear. And here are some figures. Less than 5% of the applications are downloaded more than 50,000 times. And less than 1% of the applications are downloaded more than 250,000 times. And so it means that most of the applications out there are gone. So, At this point, I think I should say that I might have misled you when I chose the session title. You all came here to understand how to survive the landslide, or in other words, how to make your game successful. But success is only the result. It's never how or why we create our successful games. Success is only and always the result. But I do think it's important to be educated by the market, so I'm going to share with you some of my experience. Hopefully, you can use it. A few years ago, I made a discovery, and this discovery has profoundly changed the way I view the mobile market, but it has also has changed the way I operate and analyze it. And it seems that there is one key element that can explain why everything is brought to the extreme on mobile and why everything changes constantly, and it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the free effect. The free effect implies that all the changes that you see in the market are a result of the, of the transition of basically everything to freemium. And I'm sure you all know what freemium means, but just in case, let me explain. Freemium is a business model in which a, an application is provided for free, and then charges for additional services and features. So, in fact, it's a combination of the two words, free and premium. Already today, 55% of the revenue generated in mobile are coming from this business model. Uh, business model. It's also the fastest growing one, which makes it the most dominant business model today. So the free effect goes as follows. Free games means less risk from the user standpoint to consume more and more games. And that means that the demand for new content is rising. Now, usually when that happens, when the demand for something is rising, rising the price also goes up until the demand drops. But that can't happen when the games are provided for free. Instead, there is no risk from the user standpoint to keep on consuming more games, and that means that when a game makes it to the top, it's not going to stay there for long because the users can go and check out the new and shiny game. So a developer that want to, wants to stay at the top has to create more game than they used to in the past when the games used to cost something. So everything is accelerating. Everything is speeding up. The circulation is higher except for the price, of course, and we all find ourselves in a bit of a problem. This is, in a nutshell, the free effect. But it doesn't stop here. There's something called 
the law of diffusion of innovation, and if you don't know the law, you must know the terminology. 3.5% of the population are called innovators. The next 13.5% are called early, adapt early adapters. The innovators and the early adapters are those people who stand in line for hours when the new iPhone comes out to the market. Those people are driven by what they believe in, whether what is available. Then you have the early majority, late majority, and your laggards. We are all on this graph in a certain point at a certain time. The law of diffusion of innovation tells us that if we want to reach massive success, we have to cross the tipping point of between 15 to 18 percent of market penetration. So it means that this is this gap right here that we want to get. And the reason why we have to go for the innovators and the early adapters is because no one else is going to try out your product unless someone else has tried it before. Now, it seems that in mobile, everything works as the exact opposite. And the reason everything works as the exact opposite is because when the games are provided for free, we can target any group that you want. And there are a few reasons why you want to consider targeting other groups. First of all, they are the majority. I mean, the majority and the laggards are a bigger group. They're called majority for a reason, which means that for the same effort, you get more people to try out your game or your product. And the second reason is that the early adapters and early majority are a great group to target if you want for someone to take a risk and try out your product. But when the games are provided for free, this risk is eliminated. Now, the laggards are those people who, try, who buy touch devices just because nothing else is available. So th it means that they are less sophisticated, less opinionated, and less critical than every, any other group. And if you don't trust me, go to your mother's computer and see how much spam and viruses and malware she has on your computer. And by the way, one of the best ways of making sure that you are hitting this target audience <laughs> is to let your mother try out your game. If she makes it, you are the, you're on the right track. So this is what we have to keep in mind. Target the leggers first, and then, of course, everybody else. So we are working in a market where all the games are provided for free, and we want to, to create our marketing plan. Every marketing plan is based on three main building blocks. The first one is the content, games in our case. The second one is the promotion, our way of getting our games discovered. And the last part is the optimization, optimizing our goals, our funnels, our uh, revenue, and everything else. Today, I'm going to concentrate mainly on the promotions aspect. Or more accurately, cross-promotion. Cross-promotion is a very traditional uh, marketing method in which a product is provided, for, a product is uh, promoting a related product. So think about Martha Stewart promoting her books on a TV show. In games, it usually refers to one game promoting a different game of the same publisher or developer. Now, to put things into context, we have reached an audience of 30 million users based on a marketing plan that uses only cost promotion without any advertisement cost. We created Playscape. It's a mega game. It contains more than 50 games, and it ties them all together to a mega, mega experience by providing virtual currency, experience points, and missions that can, uh, can be shared between different games. So there are many things that can build or break your cost promotion plan. All we did is to codify them into what we call the three golden rules of cost promotion. Rule number one, use your advertising space. You have to keep in mind that cost promotion is just another form of advertisement, so you have to know where you can advertise. And we map, uh, mapped our games into main, three main places. We have the splash screen, which is the first screen in your game. Basically, it loads when you activate your game. Then you have the loading screen, the transition screen between the different stages and levels, and notifications. Notifications are messages we send to our users when something new happens in your game. So. There are two reasons why cross-promotion has proved to be very efficient. The first reason is that you don't have to pay anything to advertise in your own game, so you don't have any out-of-pocket invest investment. And the second reason is that you don't have to worry whether you're hitting your target audience. You are. They're already playing one of your games. And what we did is to measure what we call the click-through rate to see if it really is uh, as, uh, as we expected it to be. 
And the click-through rate is basically the percentage of users who have decided to click on an advertisement after they've seen it. And what we saw is that the click-through rate ranges between 10% and 40%. Now, usually, the click-through rate, the industry standard, is between 1% to 2%. That means that even in the lowest form of cost promotion, you get a result that, it tends, that is 10 times higher than what you can expect. But this is, in fact, the lowest form of cost promotion. You can do much better than that, which leads me to the second golden rule, use incentivize. Use, uh, incentivize. Basically, you want to incentivize your users. But I think that in order to demonstrate that, I'm going to need the help of the audience. So I'm going to need a volunteer that is willing to come to the stage and jump. So just one guy or girl, or anyone that comes to the stage and please jump. Raise your hand if you're willing to come. Where's Oscar? Okay, no, wait, wait, wait. Okay. I'm not finished, I'm not finished, but thank you. Okay, but if, what if I would say that the guy that is willing to come here, we get, and I'm not kidding, this Nexus 7 device. Who is willing to come? Okay, so Oscar, you are coming. Come, please, since you volunteered even without getting anything. Thank you. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So this is why you want to use incentives. You just get much more. And luckily in games, <laughs> luckily in games, you don't have to use real stuff. You can give virtual items. So it could be anything from an animation to a log stage to something you have in your store. And using this, me this method, we've tripled the conversions and the revenue in our games. But the truth is that we can do much more than that. Because in cost promotion, you are playing the role of the advertiser and the publisher, which means that we have control over the promoted and promoting game. And that allows you to create an end-to-end -end experience, which leads me to the third golden rule create an end-to-end -end ex uh, experience. So we use Playscape. And Playscape has the same UI, the same messages, and the same rewarding system between different games, which means that the users, as they play our games, they move from one game to the other seamlessly. And what we have to keep in mind is that once we have successfully promoted one of our games, we want to keep on doing that in the future. And for that, we need an infrastructure that can last over time. And this is exact, exactly what Playscape does. So I know that I'm speaking a lot about, about Playscape, but you can really use it to anything else that you can imagine, as long as you have more than one application or more than one game. Now, not only the people that play with Playscape played uh, more games, but they also played longer in a higher frequency, and they rate Playscape higher than all of the games it contains. And this is basically what stands behind everything you do. Because you don't want to intrude your users and bombard them with all of a lot of advertisement. So what we did is to take Playscape and make it a part of the experience. And we keep the user in the center of things. Because you can create all those guidelines and all the golden rules that you want. But if the experience is not good, it's not going to work. <laughs> A few years ago, actually two years ago, I came to Kiev and I gave a lecture about how to do business in Japan. And at this time, we worked with Entity Docomo, one of the biggest and most lucrative operators in Japan. And we wanted to bring our content and distribute it in Japan. Now, today, I wouldn't imagine giving the same lecture. No one, would, no one would come. It's just not relevant anymore. And think about it. It was only two years ago. This is how fast the mobile world is changing. Now, for us at that time, when the operators started to lose control over the mobile uh, games distribution, it was a big shock for us because we had those deals, and we have to change basically everything. So the world is constantly changing, but we don't. We keep on creating and delivering games to users. And recently, I found myself asking, why? What makes us stick? So I did basically 
what anybody else would do in my situation. And I, and I went to Google and I searched. <laughs> and oh, okay, sorry. And I found a few quotes. This is uh, by Benjamin Franklin. And what he said is that games lubricate our minds. And he had the point games are the quiet corner we can escape to whenever uh, we want to escape from our day to day lives. Jan McGonigal said in her book, Reality is Broken, that gameplay is the direct emotional opposite of depression. Games are the direct emotional opposite of depression. Think about it. What an inspiring idea. And after researching, I came to, result, to a conclusion that I think that games are a form of art. In fact, they are the most progressive form of art today. They are composed of animation, sounds, graphics, and story storytelling. They keep on changing over time, and they inspire us all, uh, all. In a different conference, where actually it was a Casual Connect conference in Hamburg, different uh, city, same conference, same weather, just as cold. I met Sami Vovnov, and he's the developer of Cuddy Rope, one of my favorite games. And when I met him for the first time, it really struck me that he didn't enter the game industry in order to become successful. Actually, he told me himself, himself that he was blown away by the success of his game. And when I asked him what motivates him, he told me that it is the opportunity to create a world we can all step into that brings pleasure and can make everybody, en everybody can enjoy. And these are the type of developers that create games we all want to play. Developers that enter the industry in order to create games and deliver them, not because they want to be successful, because success, again, is only the result. It's never how or why we create those successful games. And these are truly the type of games that make it to the 1%. And these are also the type of developers that we are lo looking to work with. And we have partnerships and plans. And most, uh, most lately, we have a contest called, called Gamecast Contest 2012. And we give some very nice prizes that should give a very nice start for any developer that wants to enter the market and make his dream or her dream come true. Thank you for coming. And I wish you all a pleasant, a very successful trade show. Thank you very much. Uh, you could probably stand here to answer the questions. Thank you for the inspiration. <laughs> and those who actually ask a question will get an iPhone. <laughs> that was a joke. Если у кого-то есть вопросы, есть возможность задать их. So, any questions? Okay, so everybody is probably uh, just thinking that they should have raised their hands earlier. <laughs> no, it's not the time. Well, I think, I think everything was clear, so thank you very much for speaking, and uh, yeah.